Hello, this is Ralph doing another health research report this 28th of December 2013. I apologize for standing this time and not being behind a desk, but there is no way I am going to sit in this chair for this report. So, to get back to what we are doing today, I do have three quick reports on a few of the news articles that came out in regards to health. And the first one may not seem particularly uh, pertinent to what we're discussing, but it is still pertinent. And this one is actually titled Cinnamon Gate. Now, Cinnamon Gate is not talking about a stripper. Cinnamon Gate is actually talking about cinnamon. Now, what could possibly be wrong with cinnamon? Well, let us look. Out of an article released at the London Telegraph titled, Proposals for an EU ban on cinnamon rolls have put a damper on Denmark's Christmas festivities. Hmm? Well, the proposed ban followed plans by Denmark's food agency, safety agency I should say, can never be too safe, to implement EU regulations aimed at limiting the amount of cumarin, a naturally, uh, naturally occurring component of cinnamon, from people's diets. Under Danish interpretation of the EU legislation, the amount of cinnamon in everyday fine baked goods will be under the limit to 15 milligrams per kilo, 15 milligrams per 2.2 pounds of, and I cannot pronounce the Danish, so I apologize, Kane Snigler, Kane Little Snigler pastries. What are favorite? Or I should say here at least cinnamon baked goods or cinnamon rolls. What? Because the EU obviously is concerned about the effects of eating too much cinnamon. I'd be more suspect to see if an EU official out there doesn't have the cornered market on artificial cinnamon flavoring and trying to get rid of the real food that's been consumed for over two centuries. In the end, it is the end, this is their quote, it is the end of the cinnamon roll as we know it. Thank you, EU. Cinnamon rolls, of course, are traditional Danish baked product, obviously, and also quite common here in the United States. And cinnamon, French toast, cinnamon toast, you name it, we've been consuming cinnamon for a long period of time. Cinnamon rolls, of course, traditional Danish pastries going back two centuries. Following the road dubbed Cinnamon Gate, the Danish food authorities have given the Kanslager, oh gosh, a temporary reprieve until February, while insisting consumers should not run a risk while they eat cinnamon rolls. Insisting consumers should not run a risk when they eat cinnamon rolls. Yeah, that's not exactly, I guess, your number one call to poison control. Remember, this is the EU Commission, not the people in the EU, the EU commissioners. Which obviously, until February, means they have to worry much more about pertinent things like banking and financing and loans and debt and austerity measures. Unless cinnamon is part of those austerity measures we're unaware of. The same EU, that less than a year, I should say over a year ago, decided to say that bottled water has not been proven to prevent dehydration and therefore no medical plan can be made for water preventing dehydration. Yes, the one of the same EU. The one that's helping Europe fall completely apart. And in their words, at least you should say Danish Bakery Association words, an average person would have to eat so many Danish pastries in order to be affected, they would certainly die of obesity before being hurt by a low level of cinnamon. We do not need the nanny state or the EU to tell us what to do and certainly not how many Danish pastries we should eat for Christmas. Good one of you. As the EU burns around you, you worry about cinnamon rolls. Now we go to migraine headaches, possibly caused by the EU, or possibly caused by chewing gum. In an article titled, Chewing Gum is Often the Culprit of Migraine Headaches in Teens. This one came out of Tel Aviv University, and they said, or I should digress, say this is what the study showed. The Tau researchers, Tel Aviv University, 87% of teens who quit chewing experienced significant relief. Out of 30 patients, 26 reported significant improvement, and 19 had complete headache resolution. 20 of the approved patients 
later agreed to go back to chewing gum. And all of them, 100%, reported an immediate relapse of symptoms. And then to take a more statistical approach, Dr. Wattenberg, lead researcher, asked 30 patients between 6 and 19 years old who had chronic migraine or tension headaches and chewed gum daily to quit chewing for a month. They all had chewed gum for at least an hour or up to six hours per day. After a month without gum, 19 of the 30 patients reported that their headaches went away entirely. This is only 30 days, I should say, for the average month. And seven reported a decrease in the frequency of the headaches. To test the results, 26 of them agreed to resume gum chewing for two weeks, and all of them reported their symptoms came back. Now, in the editorial following this research, they speculate it could be one of two things. One, it could be the artificial sweeteners that are used with chewing gum, which they kind of discount a little bit, but said it's a possibility. Or, the more obvious explanation to the researchers is TMJ, or basically temporal, I can never pronounce it properly, temporal mandibular joint, or whatever, issues with the chewing of the gum, meaning just knocking the jaw out of line. It's not meant to be chewing continuously for an hour to six hours. However, the research or the meat of the article says, hey, before you start being medicated for basically headaches or migraines, or whatever you think it is, and you're chewing gum, go for the most obvious solution first. Stop chewing the gum for these 30 days, see what happens, and then consider other options. Otherwise, take ahead and make medications with chewing gum. It's only going to exacerbate, or I should say make the problem worse. And now, we go to probiotics. I shouldn't say probiotics, I should say good bacteria. And this article was published in the Journal of Cell. Now what they said was this, in a research titled, Linking autism symptoms to gut microbes called groundbreaking. They said this is the first to show that a specific probiotic may be capable of reversing autism like, like behaviors in mice. Now keep in mind, in animal studies, a lot of variables genetic modification of the animals being studied, uh, controlled environment, you name it. So it doesn't mean it's going to relate to humans, but however, though, it's the first step. They said also, had led by Elaine, I can probably mispronounce her name, so of the California Institute of Technology, the researchers used a technique called maternal immune activation in pregnant mice to induce autism-like behavior in neurology in their offspring. The researchers found that the gut microbial community of the offspring differed markedly compared to the control group of mice, meaning the group that had autism the whole internal bacteria in their gut was different than the group that did not have autism. So they noticed an observation and they wanted to work off that observation. And they found out when the mice with autism-like symptoms were fed Bacteriides fragilis, that's the, pro, the good bacteria, I should say Bacteriides fragilis, I'm not pronouncing anything right today, a microbe known to bolster the immune system, the apparent behaviors were reduced. And remember, sometimes it takes longer for a good bacteria to take hold, but this is promising. Scientific evidence is mounting that the trillions of microbes that call the human body home, because we're not homogeneous organisms, we're symbiotic organisms, our gut-linked health affecting our risk of obesity, diabetes, colon cancer, for example. More recently, researchers are discovering that gut microbes may be affecting our neurology. So it makes it interesting, an interesting uh, prospect possibly impacting a person's cognition, emotions, and mental health. So next time you take an antibiotic, it's actually maybe a, an emotion killer or a brain killer. Not necessarily the brain up here, but the second brain down here. And also too, people with autism spectrum disorder would like to have, this is an interesting thing, as far as those with autism spectrum disorder. People with the disorder would like to have their gut microbes sequenced can now do so through the American Gut Project, which is a crowdfunded research. Crowdfunded. Not National Institute of Health funded, not Procter & Gamble funded, UI crowdfunding, which is interesting. Again, I'm going to repeat it one more time in case anybody missed it. People with autism or people that know people with autism spectrum disorder who would like to have their gut microbes sequenced can now do through 
do through the American Gut Project, crowdfunded research, which is worth doing. Instead of having to go through life of agony, pain, and medication, just get sequenced. What's going to hurt? And most of probiotics are totally harmless. Beats a lot of medications that try to force your brain to do one thing other th or another thing, you know, go fast, go slow, don't think this, don't think that. You know, you get the picture. Well, again, this was an impromptu 28th December 2013 health research report with no seat. And thank you very much for listening. Once again, I'll try to do these every seven to eight days now that I'm getting things back set up over here. All right, and I'll try not to mumble at the same time. Thank you.